on World News Tonight. New escalations. North Korea causes warning sirens to go off with fresh spates of missiles affecting neighboring nations. Doubtful deals. Russia reiterates its uncertainty on the Black Sea grain export deal with fears of an about face looming. Diplomatic talks. Italy's new Prime Minister makes her way to the EU with new ideas for the nation on the agenda. And drone dance. New York sees Candy Crush painted across the night sky with the help of technology. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. North Korea is causing warning sirens to flash across Asia, with Japan responding to fresh spates of missiles being launched from the country. Meanwhile, the United States also responded to the launch, warning of repercussions. Sirens blaring in western Japan as North Korea steps up its barrage of missile tests. Firing 23 missiles, the most ever in a single day, followed by at least six more tonight. We strongly condemn the DPRK's uh, irresponsible uh, and reckless uh, activities. The most worrying, a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile fired this morning. It appears to be a Hwasong-17, the North's most advanced missile capable, in theory, of reaching the United States. Japan says today's launch appears to have failed, the missile falling into the sea. We are focused on making sure that uh, nobody attacks uh, South Korea, and uh, we're committed to that. Our commitment is ironclad, and we're also committed to deterring uh, anyone from using a nuclear device. The U.S. and South Korea responding by extending joint military drills involving hundreds of warplanes and thousands of troops. The North condemning the exercise as an irrevocable and awful mistake. Tensions now at their highest since before Donald Trump's 2018 meetings with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The Biden administration saying it's still open to diplomacy. But for now, no talks, only brinksmanship. While things seem to be smoothing over in relation to the controversial grain deal revocations, there is some hesitation on Russia's end of the bargain, claiming that they are not committed to the deal beyond the set deadline of November the 19th. Seven cargo ships left Ukrainian Black Sea ports on Thursday. That's according to the country's infrastructure ministry. It said the vessels, loaded with 290,000 tonnes of food products, were headed towards European and Asian countries. The move comes after Russia resumed participating in the Black Sea grain deal following a four-day suspension. Brokered by the United Nations, the pact frees Ukraine's food shipments from a Russian blockade of its ports. However, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said on Thursday that Moscow had not committed to staying in the deal beyond its current expiry date of November the 19th. Certainly, the discussion about prolonging the grain deal has to be continued. The official period has not yet run out. You heard yesterday the president's statement, but by November 19th, we need to provide an overall assessment of the effectiveness of the deal's implementation. And how the parameters of the deal were realized before we decide whether we continue. Peskov's comments came after a statement by Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Speaking in Jordan, he urged the United Nations to uphold its part of the agreement. In the statement, he called on the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres to fulfill obligations he agreed in the initiative. Lavrov said that he hoped the countries maintaining obstacles to Russia's fertilizer and grain exports also realized their responsibilities. Russian agricultural exports do not fall explicitly under sanctions imposed by the United States, European Union and others. But Moscow says they are badly hindered by the restrictions imposed on its financial, logistics and insurance sectors. The initiative, brokered by Turkey and the United Nations, was agreed in July to run for 120 days. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces are gathering further momentum. According to the Pentagon, it is only a matter of time before the region of Kherson is taken over by the troops, a move that will prove to be detrimental to the Russian onslaught. In what would be a major defeat for Russia in its war against Ukraine, 
Officials are now saying that Ukrainian forces are capable of retaking the strategic southern city of Kherson from Russian troops. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at the Pentagon on Thursday. Most importantly, the Ukrainians believe that they have the capability to do that. We've seen them engage in a very methodical but effective uh, uh, effort to, uh, to take back their sovereign territory. Austin's remarks coincided with a Russian-installed official in the Kherson region saying that Moscow was likely to pull its troops from the west bank of the Dnipro River, which, if confirmed, would signal a significant retreat for Moscow. The region's capital and river port is the only big city Russia has captured intact since its invasion began in late February. But Ukraine said it was still fighting in the area and was wary that Russian forces were setting a trap by pretending to pull out. Previously, Russia had vehemently denied it was planning to withdraw from the region, which President Vladimir Putin claimed to have annexed to Russia at the end of September. Meanwhile, in the northeastern city of Kharkiv, Ukrainian servicemen fired rockets at multiple Russian positions. Kharkiv in recent days has been hit by Russian missile and drone strikes, targeting infrastructure and causing blackouts. And in the capital of Kyiv, two U.S. senators, Democrat Chris Coons and Republican Rob Portman, vowed that bipartisan support from the U.S. would continue for Ukraine after next week's midterm elections. The United States has long been a nation that fights for freedom, and this is the most important fight for freedom in the world today. The visit comes amid speculation that the Republicans, seen as favorites to take control of at least the House of Representatives, could dampen U.S. support for Ukraine, something Portman appeared to refute. Clearly, what's going on here in Ukraine is something that Republicans ought to focus on because it's in our national security interest. Think of the consequences if Vladimir Putin is allowed to succeed. Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu is back in business, with a stronger backing than ever before as the final tallying of election votes confirmed his rise to power as the Prime Minister of Israel. An official tally of votes in Israel's parliamentary elections confirmed on Thursday former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's triumphant return to power at the head of a right-wing nationalist and religious alliance. The current Israeli Prime Minister, Yair Lapid, congratulated Netanyahu on his election win after a final count showed the bloc led by Netanyahu's Likud party controlled 64 seats in the country's 120-member Knesset. Netanyahu's clear parliamentary majority may end a period of stalemate that saw five elections in less than four years, and it spells the end of a short-lived coalition of centrist, conservative, leftist, and Arab parties that over the course of just 18 months in power, made diplomatic inroads with Turkey and Lebanon and kept the country's economy humming. Netanyahu has yet to be tasked by the country's president with forming a government, which could take weeks. And in doing so, he will have to satisfy the demands of those whose support he needs. First among them, the far-right ultranationalist Itamar Ben-Gvir. Ben-Gvir and his religious Zionism list won 14 parliamentary seats, making it the third largest faction in the Knesset. A West Bank settler and former member of the outlawed Kach group, which is on both the U.S. and Israeli terror watch lists, Ben Gvir wants to become police minister. But Ben Gvir's ascendancy has stirred alarm among the 21% Arab minority and center-left Jews, and especially among Palestinians whose U.S.-sponsored statehood talks with Israel broke down in 2014. With coalition building talks yet to officially begin, it was still unclear what position Ben Gvir might hold in a future government. Since the election, both he and Netanyahu have pledged to serve all citizens. Israeli media, citing political sources, said the new government may be clinched by mid-month. Italy's far-right Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni held very frank and positive talks with EU chiefs in Brussels on her first international trip since taking power. Italy's new Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni, met with EU chiefs in Brussels on Thursday in her first foreign trip since taking office last month. Beginning with European Parliament head Roberta Metsola, she also met with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and European Council President Charles Michel. In a brief interview with the press, the PM hailed the exchange as receptive. It seems to me that from a, let's say, personal and human point of view, that we had a very frank and positive dialogue. 
I'm happy with how this day has gone. Known for her firebrand, far-right nationalism, all eyes were on Maloney, as much of her campaign trail consisted of vowing to put Italy's interests above the bloc. As well as discussing Ukraine, energy prices and migration, Italy's post-pandemic recovery funds were also on the agenda as Maloney prepares to present Italy's new finance targets on Friday. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Following quickly in the footsteps of the Federal Reserve's rate hike this week, the Bank of England has also raised its base interest by 75 basis points, its largest rate hike in 33 years. The BOE rate is now at 3% as the inflation in UK continues to run at highs not seen in decades. The Bank of England on Thursday did its biggest rate hike since 1989. Its benchmark rate increased by three quarters of a percentage point to 3%. Governor Andrew Bailey said there was no choice, despite tough economic conditions. So why are we doing it? And why are we doing it now when so many people are already struggling with higher energy and food prices and other bills? Well, quite simply, we're increasing bank rate because inflation is too high. And it's the bank's job to bring it down. The BOE expects inflation to hit a 40-year high of around 11% during this quarter. It also thinks the country has entered a recession that could see the economy shrink for the next two years. The governor also had to answer questions about the country's recent political turmoil. During her few weeks as Prime Minister, Liz Truss introduced and then dropped tax and borrowing plans that spooked markets. Bailey tried to be diplomatic. Yeah, there has been a questioning of UK policy. I'll use UK policy broadly here. It's not for me to talk about, but I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm just going to talk about policy now. Um, and that will have some lasting effect, and we have to work very hard to, you know, to, to, to put that in the past, frankly. Now the UK hike comes a day after a similar increase by the Federal Reserve. The US Central Bank also said rates might have to rise even faster. But Bailey offered struggling mortgage holders a glimmer of hope. He said UK rates were likely to go up less than markets currently expected. Donald Trump is setting his sights on the White House yet again in what would be his third bid at US presidency following midterm elections. Donald Trump, looking to mount a political comeback, is considering launching a third attempt at the US presidency, and it could come soon. That's according to three of his advisers who spoke to Reuters, saying the announcement could come before Thanksgiving, as Trump looks to benefit from expected Republican wins in Tuesday's midterm elections. An announcement in the coming weeks could also box out potential rivals for the party's nomination, the adviser said, though they added it was possible the former president could still delay a decision or change his mind. Another source said Trump has been sounding out potential staff to join his team. A representative for Trump did not respond to a request for comment. Nonpartisan election forecasters and polls say it is highly likely Republicans will win a majority in the U.S. House of Representatives and also have a good shot of taking control of the Senate, which would give them the power to block President Joe Biden's legislative agenda for the next two years. But after a divisive four-year term that ended in an assault on the U.S. Capitol by Trump supporters, then two years of his baseless claims that his defeat was the result of fraud and numerous court battles, Trump remains unpopular with the general public. A poll last month showed that just 41 percent of Americans view him favorably, though he still has the overwhelming support of Republicans. I ran twice and now... In order to make our country successful, safe, and glorious again, I will probably have to do it again. Trade union members gathered on Mars as they rallied in the Spanish capital, Madrid, demanding higher wages to cope with the soaring cost of living. Thousands of trade union members marched in the Spanish capital, Madrid, on Thursday under the slogan, Salary or Conflict. The workers want Spain's government and business leaders to agree to increase the minimum salary above the current 1,000 euros a month in response to rampant inflation that's only recently started to slow. 
We want wages to be equalised and the working class to have a little more of a voice. The truth is that the sectors are lagging far behind inflation and price increases in all products. The unions are looking for a wage increase in line with the galloping inflation that's sweeping the country, and not only for the sectors with a strong union presence. Spain's inflation rate reached almost 11% in July, a rate that fell back to 7.3% in October. The Employers Association is negotiating increases with the government and trade unions, although it flatly refuses to index them to inflation. The Democratic Republic of Congo is getting a helping hand in fending against rebel troops. Kenya is the latest supporter, having military manpower become part of the offensive against M23 rebels. Kenya deployed troops to Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo on Wednesday, joining part of an East African regional force aimed to end decades of bloodshed. Kenya's President William Ruto saw off troops at a send-off ceremony in Nairobi. As neighbours, with various interlinkages, the destiny of DRC is intertwined with ours. We all have a stake in a stable Democratic Republic of Congo. And its security is an obligation that we commit our best effort to achieve. Ruto said that the United Nations and the African Union had given tacit backing to the Kenyan deployment. The seven countries of the East African community agreed in April to set up a joint force to fight militia groups in Congo's east. Congo joined the group earlier this year. Despite billions of dollars spent on one of the United Nations' largest peacekeeping forces, more than 120 armed groups continue to operate across large swathes of East Congo. This includes the M23 rebels, which Congo has repeatedly accused Rwanda of supporting. Kigali denies the claims. Uganda has already sent troops into Congo as part of a separate deployment to chase down militants linked to Islamic State, which is one of the warring groups in eastern Congo. There has been uncertainty around Kenya's deployment. That's because Nairobi wanted international funding, which requires an official mandate from the UN Security Council or the African Union. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Twitter will tell employees by email about whether they have been laid off, temporarily closing its offices and preventing staff access, following a week of uncertainty about the company's future under new owner Elon Musk. Primary schools in India's New Delhi will be shut from Saturday as capitals continue to be engulfed by high levels of air pollution. The decision to shut some schools came after concerned parents and environmentalists took to social media, urging the authorities to consider the impact of pollution on children. Protesters gathered outside the hospital in Lahore, where former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan was being treated after being shot in the leg. Cyber attacks against Australia from criminals and state-sponsored groups jumped in the last financial year, equating the assault to one attack every seven minutes. The UN Security Council held a meeting to discuss North Korea's string of provocations. The meeting was requested by the US after the North launched multiple missiles the previous day, including a possible failed attempt to fire an ICBM. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with a drone dance that took place in the New York skies as the Candy Crush game celebrates its anniversary. Thank you and have a great night.